Okay, well, welcome to the meeting. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, if you haven't been here before, it's just an informal talk about stuff in science research, big clusters, you know, pretty much anything related. Uh, very informal. I try to keep things lively, but I'm kind of relying on everybody else to contribute. Um, if you're not logged in on the pad, you can go take a look there and add any topics. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to start running through the pad. Everybody feel free to speak up anytime. Um, if you're talking and you feel like we can't hear you, uh, maybe drop it in the chat. Uh, who knows how everybody's mics are working. Uh, so, first thing on the list, um, what do you have any terrible recent outages they want to talk about? Uh, root causes, fixes, uh, bugs that might have caused it. Hey, this is Liam from the University of Maryland. How you doing? Hey, Liam. Uh, we had one outage that happened like the one week that I went on vacation about two months ago. And uh, <laughs> luckily, somebody else was able to, to resolve it without uh, paging me in. But um, we had run into a problem where we had co-located our um, database journals and, and data partitions um, on some of our NVMe drives and it filled or, or part of it filled and it didn't really spill over. So just, just a word of, word of warning uh, if anybody else is doing that. So. What version are you running? We're on the latest Nautilus, uh, but we would have been on 14.2.6 or something like that then. We're on 14.2.9 now. Okay. I have lots of stuff to talk about later because we're, we're planning to move to Octopus next month. Cool. Anyway, but in terms of outages, not not too much there. Seems like usually if if it's not like a, an enormous outage and you have corruption or any sort of problems like that, they just recommend that you recreate the OSD. And they don't seem as interested on the list anymore at trying to really dig really deeply into helping you recover it uh, like that. Yeah, so that's just like a, a few OSDs that went down on a couple of hosts. So is this a single host? Right, it, yeah, there's a couple of hosts. So okay. pretty, pretty isolated, but it just had some performance impact. That's not too bad, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> what about everybody else? Anybody else have any outages? We had a we had a CephFS outage. Um, this was more than a month ago, and we have uh, we have like nine or ten active I think nine active MDSs in a CephFS cluster, and we had one MDS that that uh, just crashed because the the machine crashed. It just rebooted, so the standby came in, but the the standby was going out of memory. And so then we, we learned that there's like, basically when you have multi, multi active MDSs, clients can, clients can like respond, can, clients can go to the wrong MDS for a particular inode. And this can lead, this can like inflate the cache sizes on any given MDS. So what we had to do was uh, was decrease the cache size of all the MDSs so that like this flushed all the, the client caches and in terms of what the clients thought that they had cached, um, what the clients thought the MDSs had cached, and this allowed this standby MDS to, to boot. So this was uh, a bit tricky and a bit scary. And there's some in, I think in Octopus, there's a new option to disable this um, behavior of a client asking the wrong MDS about an inode. Um, but this is not backported to Nautilus and not well known. 
How long did it take you to get back into service? We were we were down for around an hour because we had no idea what to do. We had to con we had to reach out to a developer to who suggested uh, decrease in the cache sizes. So now we don't. We used to run with large caches on all of these um, MDSs. Like these are 32 gigabyte VMs, and we ran with 16 gigabyte uh, MDS memory size. But now we run with four gigabytes of um, four gigabytes uh, like per MDS under the assumption that like the sum of all of the caches should sort of fit on one somehow. This might just be a, a luminous issue. We're still running luminous. So, uh, could I ask one follow up actually before we move on, Dan? Um, it, was there, did you notice any sort of performance uh, impact from decreasing the cache size? I mean, do things have to ask for perms more frequently? No, you're shaking your head now. No. Okay. No. It seems fine. How how big is your, your CephFS installation in terms of like file size or, or other things? Uh, because I'm just wondering, because uh, we have we have about 400 terabytes that we keep in CephFS, and we have much larger MDSs. They have 256 gigs of RAM each. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have it's a one petab that CephFS cluster is a one petabyte cluster, and it's like 60% used. So I think the issue here was is also because we do a lot of um, of MDS pinning, like we use the metadata pinning feature. I don't know if you use that. And we've done crazy things in the past, like moving directories around between MDSs. And I think that this leaves ghosts of I nodes in the caches of other MDSs. So I don't know how, I, I guess this kind of problem is not so frequent, otherwise more people would see it. What was the pinning call again? Oh, that's the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send a, a link. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. Anybody else have a recent outage they wanna admit to? Even be self caused, don't have to be embarrassed. All right, uh, next thing anybody hit any bugs or any new bug reports that uh, have affected you? It kind of rolls into the outage, I suppose, if uh, it caused that, but it doesn't have to have caused an outage. We're seeing a bit of a problem with Luminous and um, multi-part objects being uploaded while the bucket and then we keep ending up with buckets with objects in that we can't delete. So I think we're going to have to um, either find an updated version or temporarily disable dynamic recharging, I think. I hear rumor it's fixed in a new appointment release. I don't think that's made it through. Do you have? Can I ask? Do you do you have your um, like? Are your buckets so variable that you need dynamic resharding, or do you just have it on because it's default? Uh, no, we we turned it on because um, our, our users create new buckets and they they have a tendency to sometimes make really big ones and upload a whole pile of stuff um, and then turn it off again later. Uh, so we do have buckets of wildly changing sizes, and our users create and delete them as they see fit. So we will probably have to now essentially manually monitor that for the time being.
Uh, Matthew, sorry, I just want to check, is that your, um, uh, are those your own maps getting too big or are those actual objects being created that are in the, um, in the, in the data pool? Um, so it's, uh, well not objects, so with S3 objects get uploaded, um, objects that are large and a certain size, they get uploaded um, in, in multi parts and if, um, and the, so the bucket, the bucket gets, index gets resharded as you get over a certain object, number of objects and if that resharding process happens while there's a multi part uploading process, um, it seems, it seems like some of the multi part fragments get lost along the way. You end up with objects you can't then delete when you try and clear out the bucket later. I see. So are you are you so you're then going behind the scenes and deleting the objects out of the um, out of the data pool? Then these are kind of like orphaned uh, objects. Yeah, I think they're not quite objects, and at the moment they're kicking around, they're waiting for more time to try and track down how to actually get rid of them, um, which is obviously a bit unsatisfactory. Um, I understand it's certainly been fixed in Nautilus, um, and we think there was a fix being backported to Luminous. I don't think it's quite um, made it as far as the version in the canonical repos is yet. Cool, yeah, thanks for that. Sorry, I didn't catch that. If, uh, if I can report, we've had an interesting problem with the, uh, the balancer, uh, which seems to be fixed in Nautilus. Um, uh, I had the balancer running, um, and uh, uh, I was, uh, yeah, um, it's, yeah, it, the balancer at some point seems to uh, get into a infinite loop and um, takes up 100% of, 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 of a CPU. Um, uh, we did a bit of, uh, we, yeah, we did a bit of tracing just trying to fig see if we could figure out what is going on. Um, and it's definitely, it's getting stuck in the, um, uh, in uh, the OSD map. Um, and I, I know there've been a couple of reports, uh, being people reporting this, that yeah, that suddenly the um, the balancer just, or well, suddenly sorry, the um, the 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 Ceph, um, uh, the, Ceph, uh, the Ceph manager starts um, yeah, basically just not servicing um, Prometheus and that kind of stuff, and that that's the behavior that we saw. Um, but when kind of uh, digging down into it, uh, I realized it was the balancer because you would I would uh, unload the balancer, put it back in, and everything will start working again. As soon as I tried to run. Uh, run and uh, this is actually just um, yeah just do, doing an op doing and trying to do an, do an optimization. Um, we then started trying it with OST OST map tool um, and OST map tool had the same behavior. Um, but uh, then yeah we we tried it in Nautilus and it was working fine in Nautilus. So um, there was definitely it's definitely something that's been that's been uh, the bug has been fixed, but um, it's definitely not not um, not fixed in 12 to 12 at least. Uh, I haven't tried 12 to 13 yet. Um, but yeah, just uh, if you're seeing weirdness with, uh, say, with um, your Ceph manager, um, uh, say, kind of uh, failing in some way, um, it's definitely worth worth looking out for. Uh, this is assuming you're running Luminous still. <laughs> Interesting. I think a lot of people are trying to get off of Luminous these days. Um, see people put a couple things in there. There's a compression memory leakage through the bugs. I'm not sure who added that. Anybody want to own up to it and tell us about it? Uh, hi, I added. Uh, we upgraded uh, last month uh, one of our clusters. Uh, to latest uh, Luminous and uh, our monitoring systems uh, show us errors uh, about uh, uh, huge uh, RAM usage and uh, we noticed that uh, the pool with enabled pressure mode force uh, and the OSDs in this pool are starting using too much uh, memory uh, and uh, what is interesting uh, uh, this same day uh, the Red Hat acknowledged that 
they see this same problem on Nautilus. Uh, so it's, I think it's a generic problem when you have a, a, a big load on that on that pole, then the compression uh, engine probably have uh, some memory leak. But right now we are researching where it happens. Maybe mm -hmm. somebody of you saw. Uh, some of these behaviors. And many how, people do you, how, use, how do you enable com compression? Do you use like a, like do you use aggressive or do you use um, like what is the OSB settings and what are the pool settings when you do that? We set def uh, as the blue star mode. I I will send command because I don't remember right now. Because but the, the, what I was going to say is that if you use um, like if the OSD is set with blue store compression mode aggressive, then I think everything that the disk writes to then everything that the disk writes into blue store gets compressed, including all the maps and all of this kind of stuff. And that's what was leading to, that's what led to some big crash like that. I think I mentioned last time we, we had the, the, this call that like it exposed a bug in LZ4. But if you just, if you leave the, if you leave the, the OSD compression mode set to um, passive, then it will only compress the, um, it will only compress the pool data. So then like, when you compress just the objects, it's just like compressing large chunks of memory. So it might be, it might be better. If you're, if you compress the, okay, I see you put in chat something. This is our yeah, setting on that pool. And what's the, and what is the OSD setting? If the, the o, default yeah, one. The default one. We, yeah, we didn't change, change nothing in OSDs, and uh, we didn't. S and we see uh, one interesting thing when you have OSD memory target uh, parameter set to default, uh, there is a leakage. But when you change this parameter to the lower one, uh, the le leakage doesn't occur. Okay. We, we will try to test it, but uh, it's very interesting uh, why with normal with default options, uh, we see that uh, the process uh, uh, can uh, take eight gigabytes of RAM. Okay. Yeah, I know. Probably, probably not what I was thinking then. Hmm. Right now, with uh, decreased uh, memory size, it's running stable for two weeks. Hmm. I will paste the link from user list so you can check in free time if you want. Yeah, that'd be interesting to read. Uh, another thing somebody posted was an Octopus 15.2.2 is broken with BlueFS data corruption. I think it just added the link, so I haven't had a chance to actually read that one yet. Yeah, just don't just don't upgrade to 15.2.2. <laughs> you'll have you'll have a bad day. There have been announcements. If anybody didn't get that, and there have been announcements on various mailing lists about that. So if you if you uh, yeah. Just be aware. 
But that's only when user groups uh, paying off already. I was just gonna upgrade to that. <laughs> Pardon? Sorry, go ahead. I was saying that's just uh, with BlueFS, not the file store that the problem exists. Right. Yeah. Well, if I was the one who did upgrade and then have to work with uh, I got to sort it out, it wasn't a good day. What did sorting it out involve? What was the resolution there? In the end, we had to turn off pre-extending of the wall um, and then cycle through uh, each of the OSDs, taking it down, bringing it back up, seeing if it would come back up or whether it failed um, due to the detecting corruption. And if that happened, then we had to destroy the OSD, uh, rebuild, let it backfill, make sure it came up okay, then, then move to the next OSD and go through the whole lot. Real painful. Um, but at least in, in that way, by choosing that route, we chose the slightly riskier option of disabling extending whilst it's running. Um, I understand that there's a small risk of something going bad there, but um, I took Igor's advice and we tried it and uh, just set it globally and nothing bad happened, but I don't know what could have happened. <laughs> But essentially, it does leave you in the horrible state. If you get a power fail or something like that, then you'll lose. Basically, you've lost a large amount of data if you've got that corruption at that moment. However, so we're running at the moment with having done that, I'm running at the moment with the extending turned off, off, and I've periodically restarted it to the odd OSD just out of curiosity to make sure that Raspberry start okay um, and haven't had any more problems. But I'll, I'll let somebody else be the guinea pig for the uh, next bit. Thanks for bringing that up. Hopefully, we just saved somebody uh, a big headache. Yeah, I see somebody's asking on the list whether they uh, if you should pull that off the mirrors. Well, probably be a good idea given everybody uses Blue Store now and see what they do. All right, somebody uh, posted uh, something about an OSD superblock checksum some mismatch. Uh, yeah, it's me again. Uh, during the upgrade, uh, Tef, uh, uh, we noticed that uh, some of OSDs crashed. Uh, and uh, during our forensic, uh, we noticed that there are probably sometimes uh, some hardware-related issues, and uh, OSD can't uh, save his current uh, superblock values, so it keeps updated uh, his key value store but uh, the raw device isn't updated. After the restart of the process, uh, OS the look, looks crashed, and uh, there is a quite simple repair method, uh, and, and uh, I pasted an instruction for that. Somebody have, will have uh, sort of this issue. Uh, I noticed on the um, ERC uh, that one colleague also occurred similar issue and confirmed that uh, the hardware was a little broken. But uh, 
I'm thinking about making some uh, feature to Ceph Bluster 2, which will update the OS the super block uh, accordingly to the Kiwi store. It's just for your information. If you have some sort of problems, you can try to repair with that. There is a tool which will read the super block and will show you what the values are saved. You can check your key value store for what values are before the crash. I have a question. Uh, was there a reason why um, you weren't able to just recreate the OSD? Like, was there actual data on that OSD that wasn't contained in enough copies elsewhere? Or, or was this just to kind of learn more about how to do the repair? Uh, we had copies, but uh, it happens on first Ten hosts when we upgraded when we are during upgrade, we worried about that uh, another 100 hosts will have the same issue and uh, recreating uh, a lot of us this will take so much time. So we decided to research why it happens and how to repair that in a fast way. Got it. Is there a tracker for that issue? I didn't see a bug tracker in your in your gist. Uh, no, it isn't because I think uh, it will be better to create a feature for that. Uh, because it's not a bug of the stuff, I think, but of the hardware. And probably so I should... Uh, Create one to do to, to to take info for all the community about it. So the 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 fix that you do like injects an OSD map and then sets the sets the OSD map IDs in the super block. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Because the OSD uh, when trying to start, uh, the first thing is checking the checksum of uh, OSD super block, and uh, that was a mismatch uh, between the real OSD super block checksum and the stored one in uh, key value store. But uh, there is a ignore checksum option with enable it. Uh, the OSD tries uh, to read the very, very old OSD map, the Cafo store. He can because it doesn't exist. So the simplest way was to inject uh, the old uh, OSD maps and then it goes up. Thanks for typing all that up. It's pretty interesting. A good read. <clears throat> yeah, I'll have to leave that tab open to read it after this call. Sounds really interesting. Uh, next one is adding new hardware to expand clusters, gentle reway, upmap. I just added about a petabyte and I just did a gentle reweight 
on my cluster to kind of move it up to the full weight of those, of those new drives. So if I can ask them, um, uh, did you, because every time I've done a gentle reweight, it moves a whole bunch of data, <clears throat> you know, there's a crash map re recalculation. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of data moving around the cluster, which doesn't need to. Um, did you observe same same result, uh, say, uh, similar kinds of uh, problems, or um, yeah? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a problem. I just kind of up do them like a, a weight of two per increment. Okay. Um, and the last ones I did were twelve terabyte drives. And yeah, it moves a lot of extra data around. Yeah, because yeah, uh, I mean we've got that. PGs up to up to 100 gigs, um, and so every time we do a recalc, we're moving like um, you know tens of hundreds of gigs around, uh, which just seems completely pointless. <laughs> um, so it, it is, uh, you know, it's, and you kind of need to, uh, yeah. So uh, so we've uh, we've tried gentle reweight. We also we just try to um, so I mean yeah we've also just tried to just drop hardware in and and see what Ceph does. Um, and what you noticed was that uh, because our PGs are so big, uh, when it um, does the recalc, um, it doesn't. It, it, obviously, it's not. It's not looking at the size of the PGs, um, and we immediately started overfilling OSDs on the on the new hardware. So that we definitely thought that wasn't the way to do it. We then tried gentle reweight, and we were a bit unsatisfied with the fact that every time we did a gentle reweight, we were kind of moving data on that we didn't want to. So um, so we're looking at using upmap, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, it seems like that when we um, uh, basically what you do is, you, I mean, yeah, this is uh, something that Dan talked about a, a while back, where you um, uh, you set no rebalance on the cluster, and then you um, uh, you add, you change the crash map, and then you uh, use uh, up map to up map all the PGs back to where they were. Um, and this this all seems to work. The cluster goes back to health okay, but then um, uh, whenever I run the rebalancer again, it tries to undo what I've done. <laughs> so it's basically just moving all that data again. Um, so, I, I, and I just thought this is a, a, we about to, yeah, I want to start trying to use this in, in production. So I've written a whole bunch of scripts that does this automatically for me. And uh, it's pretty cool. I can, I can go and I can, um, I set no rebalance, I add new hardware, and then I, I, within three or four minutes, I've got the cluster back to, um, back to an okay state. Um, but then, as I say, then I think, okay, cool. I want to run the balancer now to get the data back onto, um, uh, well, to get the data into the new, the new hardware, the new, newly freshly added hardware, and um, it does a whole bunch of other stuff instead. Um, and you can see if you look at the, um, if you if you use OC Map Tool, you can see all the stuff is kind of, uh, kind of hints hints at it there. Uh, because if you look, there's um, in the OC in the OC Map, uh, if you use OC Map Tool, you can get a copy of the OC Map and then you dump it into JSON output, and you can um, you can scroll through it. And you can see there's uh, there's uh, PG temp items and there's PG app map items and a whole bunch of stuff. And um, it's it's uh, it's basically when it does when the balancer does its work, it goes and has a look at that, and it basically has to follow the rules that are set there. Um, and it seems almost impossible to undo those um, that bits of information. So it's it's like almost like even you know using the the app map, you still need to do do those bits of data that you didn't want to move. Um, but as I say, I thought this was a perfect opportunity just to find out if anybody else has um, used uh, AppMap um, and whether they've had similar experiences, um, and also just to check if other people are doing it any any different ways. Um, people are, uh, yeah, if there's any other interesting way to kind of add add new hardware without this um, this data movement. We are perhaps. Brave, but when we plot, last time we added another wrap to our Ceph cluster, we just added it and let Ceph rebalance it. We have the um, the tunables for re rebalancing set pretty low, um, and we just added it and waited for it to help out. Um, and it might not have been the most elegant solution, but it was certainly easy. Uh, Matthew, sorry, you said you had the tunables. Which which uh, which tunables uh, was? was sorry, just what do you mean by that? Um, I would have to go and look them up. Uh, if so, if you like, drop me an email later. But it's the ones about um, how many um, PGs your the cluster will try and uh, remap onto a particular OSD at, at once and backfilling and that sort of thing. Um, I can't okay. remember off cool. the top of my head. Yeah, it's certainly be interesting. I'll, I'll I'll send you an email. Thank you. I have similar for like the tunables. 
kind of just limiting how fast it goes um, or when I just do my kind of steps of reweights. What I do, it just never causes a problem for client I.O. Okay. But it does move around data fast enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, missing gentle reweights is, is good. And, uh, but as I say, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just trying to see if there's any clever way to avoid this unnecessary data movement, um, if, if it's at all possible. But as I say, it's, so far in my experiences, it's not possible. Yeah. Um, are you interested in sharing those scripts at all that you've written? Uh, yeah, manages, sure. so. no, uh, definitely. At at some point, I will. I will. Um, uh, I just didn't want to. Uh, uh, yeah, I want to kind of understand what's what's going on first um, before I, I, um, I, I show them. Because um, yeah, I've, I, I've I've yeah, I've had a look at at various options. I mean, this because there's, cause there's um, PG app map allows you PG app map and PG app map items. And um, I, in the beginning, I was using PG app map items, but um, uh, what seems to happen is that when you use PG app map items on um, on a PG where the primary OSD is changed, um, it it, uh, it it doesn't allow you to you, it doesn't allow you to app map. It kind of changes up one of the OSDs the whole time. <laughs> um, so then uh, there's a there's a command called PG app map which allows you to just say this is what the um, what the uh, app map set must look like, um, and that works that works great. Um, but like I said, then there's kind of there's this uh, there's this hysteresis in the system. Um, you know that uh, every time you run the balancer, it goes and Looks at at what you've done and says no no I need to undo all of this and it just starts starts and undoing all my all my all my cleverness <laughs> which is uh, which brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. So there's some in like when whenever you inject a new up map like a PG up map items there's a function that gets called I think it's called clean clean up maps or something like that. Yeah. And it just has it has a few like heuristics to make sure that you haven't done you haven't done some up map which is like illegal, which is breaking the failure domain. Yeah. But this thing probably removes, like especially for erasure code pools, it probably removes things that would be even valid up maps occasionally if you were if you were generating those up maps okay. yourself. So that's probably yeah, the source. Have, and yeah, I have done and maybe that, map and sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, Dan, yeah, okay. You know, it's just that maybe maybe with the up PG up map instead of up map items, it it might. Call it, it might not use that same clean cleaning heuristic, so then it might just have it stick. Or maybe like maybe you are maybe you are up mapping in a case that's like breaking the failure domain. Is that possible? Like uh, no, like no. mapping two or to the same one PG to the same rack twice or something? Uh, well, just to describe what I'm doing uh, is yeah. I mean I'm uh, I'm yeah. So I'm setting no rebalance on the cluster. Um, I'm then uh, I'm then Changing the crash crash map, um, it so then it sets a whole bunch of PGs into remapped uh, backfilling and backfill weight. Um, I then go and uh, run an analysis on that and just look at what the acting set is, um, and then just uh, call PG app map uh, uh, OSD PG app map with the with the acting set um, so that it forces the app set to be the acting set. So it does this whole like uh, yeah, rewind. Um, and I say it, it works like a charm. <laughs> it's, it's great. But um, yeah, yeah. I said then when as soon as I start running the balancer, the balancer is going and and uh, and so, uh, so somehow in the uh, in the OST map, it's 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 keeping track of 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 what I'm doing. If, and if you look at the uh, at the OST map, um, it lists uh, some yeah in PG in PG app map. I can see it's it's listing a whole bunch. Of, it's listing the OSTs that I've that I've I've um, uh, that I've set. Um, and then I so said then it tries to start undoing this. So because uh, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. For the, yeah, for the thinking, balancer, sorry. Yeah. So go go, go finish, finish. Okay. So for the but balancer, yeah, we have a latency, obviously. So the balancer, we you need to turn it off when you're doing those kind of up map remount, up map uh, remapping because it will, um, obviously, it will undo what you do. But that's sort of exactly what you want it to do afterwards, right? You want to. You want to up map to where the data is now, and then you want to gradually remove those up maps to put the data onto the new disk. Isn't that what you want to do? Yeah, th that is. Yeah, exactly. But um, uh, so I do that, and as soon as I run the balancer, the balancer is not actually moving any data onto the new hardware. The balancer is just moving, um, moving, moving PGs around. <laughs> um, anyway, but 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 the new hardware. And um, so I said I've, I'm. 
I, and I say, I've, this is on our test cluster, and I've, I've really I've brutalized this poor test cluster. So it's it's entirely possible that I've just broken something somewhere, and uh, um, and that and that's that's what I'm seeing. And you know, so if, um, um, th 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 this could be kind of just the fact that I've um, that I've really kind of messed messed the PGs around. That this is um, that that it's that it's like that. Um, but but yeah, that's why I thought I'd just check if anybody else has used AppMap and had some experiences or. or um, because um, it's yeah, cause it's quite nice now. I can now, you know, when I um, I, I can go and do an analysis and I can see where it's where it's trying to move data to. I, I basically list the rack and the host that it's um, that it's trying to move data to, just so I can get an idea about what um, and then the size of the PG as well. Just get an idea about what data is moving around. Um, and so then that's that's when I started seeing kind of like things are not 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 uh, doing what I thought they were doing. I said, then I run the balance again. I look at the analysis and it shows me that, yeah, it's not trying to move any data onto the new hardware at, at, at all yet. Um, but like I say, I mean, if, if other people have been using this and it's 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 not exhibiting the same kinds of issues, um, then then it's, it's clear, clear that I've, I've just I've just broken the um, our test cluster um, and that I should be, um, yeah, and yeah, that's, that's basically the issue, but uh, um, but yeah, but I have, yeah. So has, is everyone using this kind of um, idea in in production <laughs> as well? I guess. <laughs> have you tried this running U8 by utilization a hundred times in a row? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, no, That's, sure, we, yeah. I've run into just like so many problems over the years using the balancer that I. I think I have it enabled, but I still have things that occasionally fill, so I just use reweight by utilization. That okay. that command. Uh, is, is, I was kind of joking, uh, but it actually kind of works sometimes. Yeah. In, okay, cool. Because it's it's uh, doing what you want it. That's that's one yeah. of the um uh, that's one of the CERN Ceph scripts, right? Is that is that correct? No, it's built in. It's Ceph OSD reweight okay. by utilization. Ceph OSD reweight by utilization. Okay, cool. I'll go take a look. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. All right, next one. Uh, telemetry, any issues with your institution signing off on using that? Uh, yeah, I'll put that one up. Just um, we are finally getting to start looking at Nautilus uh, um, putting it on production in due course. And one of the things I want to do is um, enable the telemetry. And I was just wondering if, because uh, we'll have to get that signed off by our security team. And I was wondering if people have found that to be straightforward or if there's been issues with it. I mean, looking at the the data that's shared, I can't see it will be a problem, but I'd just be interested if anyone has. Any, any kind of interesting stories of either success or otherwise with that? Well, for mine, um, I looked at the data being shared, didn't tell anybody, and enabled it. But I'm kind of a one man team, so. I did a similar thing to Kevin. I just kind of looked and it looked pretty innocuous, so I didn't really ask for anybody's permission and did it, but I'm also on a smaller team. I mean, the main problem I've had with telemetry is that when it falls over, like when their elk stack goes down, it puts your whole cluster into a warning mode that is hard to clear without restarting your, your bonds or your managers, I forget, whatever you're supposed to restart, um, which they've been trying to fix and maybe is fixed in the latest releases, but it's still been giving me, me trouble with the telemetry module falling over and paging you. So I think I think just technical issue. <laughs> Matthew, you deal with uh, like more health and genomic data, right? That probably has more restrictions, which is why you might need the well definitely need that write off, right? Yeah, that's right. That's what it's. I don't know. It maybe seems like a, quite a few other people are having 
are, are maybe afraid about accepting the responsibility for enabling in their organizations. Because if you look at the, the public dashboards they have, it doesn't look like there are too many clusters with telemetry enabled. Um, there were also a couple like, of bugs. There were some bugs, right? And it was crashing. It was like crashing right. the AGR times. Yeah, yeah. So we have it. We just have it off now because of that. Because I don't really, I don't know. I don't want to be woken up because of that. Right. That's what happened to me. Yeah, it was waking me up in the middle of the night and stuff. Um, right. Maybe we're gonna that, fix that case, we'll, we'll, we'll try. We'll try on our test cluster, and if it um, causes problems, then we'll hold off even thinking about putting it on production. <laughs> So the issue was that when the telemetry server goes down, there was no there was no exception handling for that in the in the telemetry module, and this has happened That's a couple a of times bad. now. I think, yeah, it's happened a couple of times. I think they put in something, but I don't know exactly the status of that. Yeah, they they've merged certain fixes, but it seems like it's kind of been like whack a mole. They have they haven't really nailed it yet. So. But when it does happen, I mean, it's it's harmless. Like it's it's never gonna. It's isolated enough in a module where it's it's not going to cause a production outage. It's just annoying to get paged and have it complain so loudly. So they've been reducing. They've also been reducing those failures from a error to a warning or something like that. Yeah. So don't worry about telemetry. It's it's just going to cause you heartache. You know, just try it another year or two and figure out the sign off then. <laughs> Uh, anything uh, positive, negative with Octopus upgrading, fresh installs? That us eight versus seven. Anybody using it in production, or is it just all test clusters so far? I, I only have plans to go next month. So whenever whenever fifteen two three is out, if nobody's upgraded to fifteen two two, whenever that's out, uh, I'm gonna give it a spin. And I have a pretty mixed workload between a pretty large, you know, about two and a half petabytes in um, object storage or RAS gateway, and then uh, about half a petabyte in ZFS. That's lots of lots of small files and lots of concurrent users. Um, so we'll see. But in the future, but I, I don't know. Has anybody else actually upgraded? Well, actually, I did. So Andre here. So I have a 1.1 petabyte and 350 OSD cluster, which is an octopus. Unfortunately, to two now, but I didn't have an issue so far. It's quite heavily used for the CFFS and for the job processing, so data processing. So typically, uh, 10, 5 to 10 gigabytes per second all the time. So no issues so far. And actually, it works much better than Nautilus. So. But I'll check. We have this uh, corruption box anyway. So. The corruption only it? happens when you restart the OSD. Oh, I restarted them uh, several times already because in the meantime we did the full migration of hardware and recreated the, all the OSDs and to move to LVM because it was painful to maintain them in the old state. So, so when you say it's better, be it. better how? It works faster, let's say. That's most okay. most smooth, less less load. On the service, and uh, we got a higher throughput. I think. Is that because they made certain blue store uh, optimizations in Octopus? Certain. Maybe yeah. I'm not sure. So, but we, we upgraded the okay. kernels as well to the latest ones, so it might be related. So. Okay. I've only upgraded a small cluster, but it uh, was noticeably faster. 
it was the, the, the immediate the immediate thing you noticed was it was much snappier, seemed, seemed much snappier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The same as Forest. May, may I just mention one thing because I've seen several issues. When you have really heavy write in the CFFS, and if you're doing maintenance or let's say recovery of disks, or if you're uh, rebooting the nodes or upgrading them, then it can happen quite a lot of time if you don't have enough backfills uh, per OSD, let's say, then the degraded, the number of degraded uh, blocks can grow in time because the some placement groups which are degraded can stay uh, degraded because they're waiting for the slots, right? And this might be automated somehow. It's not important when you do rebalancing or misplacement, it doesn't matter, but for the, for the grading part, it's really critical. So let's say we, have, we got quite used to do this whenever we do maintenance to increase it to 16 threads per OSD or even 32 to get it faster, uh, faster recovery as soon as possible, but this might be automated. This can actually appear even if there was no degradation initially, so only misplacement. <laughs> Yeah, we, we do the same. We 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 inject higher number of backfills when we're doing when we're doing this kind of thing. It's supposed to prioritize the degraded PGs first, but this doesn't always work. Yeah. Well it does, but sometimes there are too many. Which are degraded. Ah oh, yeah, yeah. And if they don't start, that's true. Yeah. I found that when I was doing the repairs on the mall and rebuilding the corrupted ones, um that yeah, certainly why it was a default setting of one. It was painfully slow, uh, but crank, I cranked it up to about eight, and it was much, much better. I was only doing one at a time, and it did correctly do the degraded ones first. So that was only one I was at a time. But just to be clear, Andre, you can inject that um, you can inject that setting BlueFS pre-extend WAL files. You can just set it to false on the running OSDs, and they like heal themselves. That was the procedure you went through, right, Chris? Yeah, I'll do. That. No, 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 not, not quite. You, you you can oh. set it to false, um, but there is yeah. there is a small chance that something will go horribly wrong there. I don't quite understand what that is, but I know Argo was concerned about it, but he said it was a very small chance. Um, okay. So we we took I I injected it on the fly into one OSD and ran that for a little like while and time. yeah I tried another one and in the end I just put it in globally. Um, didn't, there were no but no effects bad effects that I saw. So then it was just a matter of I mean, if you leave it when it's for, leave it to run for a while while it's set to false, then eventually. As it reuses and recycles blocks out of the wild, they get written uh, with correct valid data. So one option is just to you know reset it and then just leave the things for a while. But of course, you, you never know how long you need to leave them, and you can't tell whether or not they're uh, intact or not. Right. So so we made the setting, left it for a little while, day or so, and then. Um, uh, then I went round and um, recreated the ones that had that would not restart. We we found out they wouldn't restart because the day after the upgrade, I rebooted one node, um, and only half the OSDs came back. Um, so there was a certain amount going on. I don't know how much the type of media that the well is on affects it. We had a as on in the uh, because the bug was due to the uh, asynchronous I.O. library processing uh, I.O.s out of order, oh, yeah. uh, and, and those overlapped. So you could 
uh, because it was pre-extending, it would try and extend a bit further, and then you get an overlapping one coming in later for the bit you'd extend it into, but they got done in the wrong order, so you ended up with zeros there instead. This is essentially what was happening. Um, so I don't know whether that's aggravated by having um, by using NVMe, which of course can have a much bigger reordering queue. Um, but I mean, the good news is that you know, having gone through each one once we'd recreated it, and um, it's important to have these extend setting global at that point, so you don't ever run them as you're creating a new one. You don't want it to be running at all with extending. And they they ran okay after that. Uh, we're still running with with false, obviously, and I assume that there is a minor performance hit, uh, but it hasn't been too noticeable. Um, but then, yeah, it was just a matter of going around one by one and uh, hoping we got round before anything else crashed. Because you don't know that it's wrong until you've re restarted the, uh, that OSD. But when when you restart OSD, just to be clear, then you know that something is going wrong. I mean, you don't have hidden corruptions when you restart. As, as you restart it, it fails to restart because it, it, it warns about a um, corruption in the middle of the while record and just, just okay. refuses to start. So if you ever, if you did shut down, you know, trigger, you know, complete reboot or something like that, then you would be in the lottery then as to whether you've lost data. Yeah, so. Oh, you mean the good, the good side is that we actually managed to get the whole thing re fixed and uh, repaired, and seems to be working fine without any downtime or loss of data. So. But it was a bit irritating. Anything else does anybody want to say about Octopus? Otherwise, we can start talking about how Ceph ADM uses containers and dockerizing everything. What are your thoughts on that? Personally, I'd like to leave Docker out of it. Um, and Octopus, it's, it's a little bit better um, because I use Podman um, and I find the containers just to be cleaner. So I must also state, I'm not really a Ceph user. I just like play with it in the lab. Um, but uh, I've done it a few times with the containers and just absolutely hated it. And then I did it with Octopus, and I'm like, okay, this is heading in the right direction. Um. Yeah, we have no interest of uh, dockerizing anything at Diamond. I have to admit, I'm well, we're not going to have a choice eventually, right? That's <laughs> it's, you're not going to be able to opt out after after Octopus. I think in the next one, that's like the only. The only option. Yeah. I don't, I'm mostly concerned about performance, like just having an extra shim here. And like for our our cluster, we use um, device mapper because we have big JBODs with multi-path drives. And so I'm just wondering, like, if you have this extra layer, are we going to run into weird problems with device mapper and uh, and those sorts of technologies and I don't know, but it, it yeah. does seem like a pretty nice, uh, Ceph ADM does seem like a nice gym to just make it easier to do the life cycle management. And they say that you won't even have to worry about like where your OSDs get placed on your hardware. It'll just like figure all this out and stuff. But I, I'm not quite sure how it's going to match that up. You know, like if I'm trying to do something special, like I have, um, a host that has, you know, 60 spinning disks and it has, you know, six uh, NVMe drives to, you know, do the journal caching or something like that. Like, how is it going to, 
is it going to be smart enough to actually correctly use all of that hardware? Like, I, uh, I, I don't see how that's going to happen. Yeah, from our perspective, we have quite an interesting use case. We use Ceph more as like an object store burst buffer. So we deploy, uh, deploy it onto a RAM on our HPC cluster. So the idea of uh, dockerizing as well on top of that, we want to be as close to like bare metal as possible. So it's, um, it's a bit disconcerting on our side, but otherwise. For our main cluster, we're not too fast on it. You said you're, you're running in RAM. You have a cluster that yeah. runs in RAM. Wow, okay. Yeah, so, I think that's the first so, time I've ever heard anybody say that. <laughs> yeah, so we have it. So when someone wants to, so we've currently got it into semi-production. So when someone wants to spin up a job that would go on the cluster, so instead of using our file system, we deploy the object store as they create their job. They can then run inside the object store, and then they can chuck that out somewhere, and then the object store then closes. So then Ceph just breaks itself down again. So they can have object storage on the fly that's fast. That's how we're using it at the moment. That's a very interesting use case. Do you create these memory OSDs dynamically, or, or how do you manage that? Is it like a RAM disk, or can you um, tell us a bit so more about that? Yeah, so it, it can't use a, a proper RAM disk in sense because um, uh, Ceph uses LVM. So you can we have our own in-house uh, kernel module that presents RAM as a block device currently, and then there's also uh, the Linux default, which is BRD. So um, what we do is on the so when the user uh, asks for some uh, RAM, well for the system, they then say how much RAM they want, and then it's split up into OSDs on the host that they're using dynamically, so they can request as much as they want. You know, as long as it can, like we have the resource allocation, it then accesses it, runs on that, and then poses itself down. That's a pretty cool idea. Thank you. You may have stolen all the interest away from talking about Ceph ADM. <laughs> uh, well, that's just our opinion on it. It's not. For a deployment of like buses that aren't used temporarily, it's not too much of an issue. So. Well, it sounds like maybe we could form a separate uh, support group for people who are being forced to move into Docker for future deployments as a, a sidecar to this. <laughs> I think we all stick. So we currently use um, Ceph Anthropol, and we'll certainly be using that for Nautilus as, as we start rolling out Nautilus. And as to Octopus, I think it's a bit, a bit far in the future yet. yet. Um, I'm not. I think I share some of the concerns of the folk expressed about adding Docker into the mix, but I guess if we're going to have to do that, we'll have to see how it works in practice. I guess that the, the one silver lining could be that if if there's less, if, if it's easier for the Ceph developers to kind of manage something that's inside a Docker container, like there's less variability in the different operating systems they're running on and all of that stuff, then, you know, that could be good for for all of us so maybe slight performance hit but more more reproducible um, environments for them to test against yeah that could definitely be a benefit for them i think the you know over the last few years a big push has been you know, make stuff easy to use and install so that anybody could do it in an afternoon. That's kind of led to using containers. That's the, the hot topic, and everybody knows them these days. They can do a Docker start. Well, they're probably going to get 
so deep in bed with it that there will be there's no going back. So. I hope not. A lot of us like to stay close to the bare metal, and every time something yeah. you know goes crazy in my Kubernetes cluster, it's just the biggest pain in the ass to troubleshoot. Usually, yeah, I, I fear. I know. I mean, the Ceph won't be in Kubernetes, but you still have Docker or Podman there, and that layer of ambiguity that it gives you, and it, for troubleshooting at least. The simplicity, it it could be nice. So I heard uh, some people are using Ceph Ansible. Um, that, that's pretty much what I use. Uh, Ceph ADM is the the future. Is there is there anybody using Rook currently? Maybe not. Okay. Nope. <laughs> we can skip that one. Don't have to learn it. I think that's usually if you're mostly if you're running in Kubernetes. And we all big enough clusters that that'd probably be crazy to do. Yeah. I'd need a, an extra day in the week to make all of that work. <laughs> yeah. Just as kind of an addendum to the Ceph ADM, I put a note about, you know, we're going to move to probably rel eight concurrently with doing some of our upgrades um just because it seems like there's uh new features coming out that are not going to be supported in rel 7. uh so like we don't run a dashboard today actually we, we'd like to do that we have like a few grafana dashboards that we have set up on our own um but i'm just kind of interested in seeing what's what's in the dashboard v2 so rally will support that plus I mean, I guess it's already support, but I, I know that there are certain things coming down the pike that are rel only. So maybe I got that wrong looking at the release notes. I don't think somebody wants to talk about not running a stock CentOS kernel from long, long ago, or CentOS 7 at least. And we're using like the, I forget what repo it is, the actual ones where it's the 4.x or 5.x kernels. Yes, <clears throat> that would be me. Um, I'm just kind of curious what people are running besides the stock kernel, I guess. So, so we're running into bugs. Seems to be fixed upstreams and then generally get sort of, if you're reading the mailing list, you get the sort of notion that people are using newer kernels. So just thought it would be a good place to ask. Um, I'm not, but it has crossed my mind many times given the ease of installation from the, those CentOS 7 repos to get something a bit newer. I just never pulled the trigger on it and have done a large amount of my hardware. So I'm kind of curious too. I'll, I'll can, I, we'll, we'll start running the, the 5.6 or something like that uh, soon and we'll do some testing so I can probably I'll have something to talk about the next meeting, uh, our experiences doing that. So. Yeah, cool. That'd be uh, nice to hear about. It looks like there's a couple of mimic things for the last year. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of I client think. isn't responding. Yeah, it's. I read about uh, we're updating to Nautilus, and I I read that they've uh, re redone this part in in Cephas where we're uh, long running clients and, and heavy pressure and, and so it's it's handled in a better better. And it's also this we're getting the slow requests sort of things where where 
the users are running sort of locking themselves uh, sort of uh, not revoking read and uh, rather write locks so any had any it's almost had any experience from previous running uh, mimic and stepping up to nautilus and if it gets better i guess it would but really from the release notes to it would be get, getting better but does anyone have any sort of real life experience I had one, uh, I've been looking into this recently because on our SFFS we get this pretty often. And so what I, what I re learned is that there's an option in Luminous and, not, and Mimic, well also still in Nautilus. It, it controls like the maximum number of caps that will be um, trimmed from the, from the LRU cache. This might not be exactly related. I might be confusing two things, but there's an option to, to, to control the number of caps which are trimmed from the LRU cache each uh, MDS tick. And in in Luminous and Mimic, this uh, this is like 32,000, and the tick is every five seconds. And in Nautilus, it's still 32,000, but the tick is every one second. So it trims a lot more quickly. Um, So that, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I, these two issues are confused, are, are always like, they always happen at the same time for us. Like, we'll get client isn't responding to, 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 the, to the client caps revocations. And then also the, uh, like the, the MDS cache can go, can be too large, can be larger than what, what it's supposed to be. So on our cluster, we're, we, we haven't upgraded yet to Nautilus. We, um, I just increased that the this value from 32k to like 400,000 or something, and it and it fixed that memory issue for us. Um, it might also fix the it might help with this um, with the client caps. I'm not 100% sure about that. Good advice. Thank you. I'll I'll find the option. At least at least it will tell you where to look. It can tell, give you a hint where to look. I'm not. It's not. It's not guaranteed to help. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And I have a final sort of short question if, if, if there's still time. So we're getting these kind of large OMAC objects warnings, but it's in the, in, in the metadata store. So it seems to be the, like, like a file that keeps track of how many files are open or something like that. And that keeps growing. And I read a post on the forums that you should just increase it. And I'm up to, uh, I don't know, 400,000 or something. At the moment, so does is there? I guess there's a drawback of, of setting it too high, but what what can one do really? Is there sort of? Oh I didn't quite catch it. What was the? Yeah, yeah. The, <clears throat> I, I get warnings that there's large all map objects. So oh. you can run into so files that are sort of larger than what's supposed to be or something like that. So and, and it's in the in the metadata store. And when I look at the object that's too big, it seems to be the file that keeps track of open files or something like that. So so it's naturally growing since I have like 500 clients and, and they're doing they have lots of files open. So can, that's where I guess Seth is keeping track of open files. So, so it makes sense that it grows. Uh, the more users I put on, and the more open files they have. So, but I, I was thinking about is there? I guess there's a drawback, and, and uh, it, it's related to recovery. If I have it too large, but but does anyone have a sort of has anyone increased it, and and has it been safe, or has have have you been running into problem problems? I think it's at the 400k at the moment, or yeah, we we increased ours on our cluster. I remember, I think we increased it by four x or something like that. Because basically, we had been running fine before, and I think it was just a new version where they they tweaked where they warn about it or, or something like that. Um, so, I mean, it it could be a problem, but I think there are a lot of instances where the Ceph developers are too conservative about where they've 
set these limits on large OMAP size. Mm -hmm. And also they might be optimizing for smaller clusters than what some of us are running. So I don't know. Okay. But yes, I have increased it. It was not a problem. That's a good point. Thanks. I think they reduced it by 10 times uh, between going off to Mimic or something like that. I read so. so but uh, it's, it's good. It's valuable information. Thank you. Well, that kind of wraps up our list and the pad. Is there anything else anybody wants to bring up before we call it a day? Uh, I had a small idea that maybe we could send out a survey of what different people who are attending these are running, kind of the shape of their cluster. Like, are you using Blue Store? What version are you running? Uh, like, the difficulty is probably in coming up with like a meaningful list of like you know 10 questions that you could ask but uh i thought it could be interesting because sometimes like if you have a problem you might want to go to people who are running in a similar thing and we do it in an ad hoc way here which is great but uh it could be interesting to kind of see who's best matched up with similar setups to you sure so it's like kind of like how big stuff team they do that survey once in a while but actually attaching a email address to some of the clusters so you know who to contact for questions. Right. Um, if anybody wants to put down that information in the pad, uh, feel free. And sure. A very informal way of doing it, um, unless you want to open it up to like the Ceph users list. Um, yeah, we can start. This information in this main pad where you have uh, each uh, each each of our videos. Oh sure, yeah, that could if you use that main index pad, that could be a nice place where yeah, if everybody wants to put down you know name, email, what you're using, versions, gateway, object store, blue store, file store. You know, CephFS, whatever, and cluster size, stuff like drive types, general information, maybe that could be useful. So if anybody wants to ping somebody, they can. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Maybe could, yeah, maybe we could start with that. And if it's useful, I could try to structure it a little, like, um, and send it out on the, the email list, maybe. The, the, the list you've set up, Kevin. For Sure. Uh, for the group. Optional. I, I don't want to give anybody homework. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I think that wraps it up. Unless anybody else has anything else. All right, well, now been a year since the last Cephalocon. Hopefully, they'll get another one together to go out and venture through the world. Otherwise, uh, next one, uh, fourth Wednesday of July. July 22nd. I'll send out the reminder as usual four to seven days ahead of time. Um, uh, yeah. Just out of curiosity, I'm new to this meeting. Uh, can you add me as well? So here is Luca from the Post Digital Computing Center in uh, Western Australia. I just uh, had myself uh, in the signing list and Dan invited me, but I'm not in the, I guess, the recipient of this. Uh, yeah, sure. Like I send out one to the stuff users list, but I do send out like a private one to people who have joined in in the past. So I will definitely add you to my list of like private people to email. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks for joining in. Yeah, cheers. All right. Um, everybody, take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day at work, or most of you are probably pretty much done for the day. And we'll uh, talk to you in July. Okay. okay. Thanks for organizing this. Talk to you later. Yeah, no problem. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.